This is a production of Cornell University. So I'm here today to talk about mushrooms and international development. Um, I was able to travel to two unique locations in the world, Bangladesh and Rwanda. Um, Bangladesh was not all about mushrooms. I did go following love. I went to go visit my girlfriend Amanda while she was collecting her data um, for her PhD. Um, thanks, Amanda. Um, but it was also for adventure. You know, there's a lot of lessons that uh, you can't learn in the classroom and you can't find in the library. And so I was really excited for these sort of experiential learning opportunities. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm interested to get into international development. Um, and I asked P Dr. Peter Hobbs, who some of you may know, um, I asked him how I could become involved in international agriculture development. He said, Brian, you just got to do it. You just got to go there and get experience and do it. And so I went. And uh, that's that. Um, this is also sort of uh, an opportunity for my own shameless self-promotion. Um, I'm going to hopefully graduate this May, so I'll be looking for a job. If anybody knows a good, good opportunity, I'd be happy to entertain that. Um, so let's start by combating stereotypes about mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are the fruiting body in the kingdom fungi. Uh, fungi are their own unique kingdom. There are a number of um, players, the good, the bad, and according to George Hudler, no, no uglies, right? Um, and there's a number of uses, a number of ways different mushrooms and fungi can contribute to society in terms of human health and ecological health. Um, so yeah, and then you know one stereotype we encounter a lot here in the university is the um, psychedelic mushrooms. So if you guys need to get it out of your system, maybe make a joke to your neighbor really quick, and then we can move on from this stereotype. <clears throat> um, so <laughs> I uh, first became interested in mushrooms in reading this book, Mycelium Running, by Paul Stamets. Uh, Paul Stamets is a he's a rock star mycologist, um, really very. Um, persuasive and sort of convincing all the benefits that mushrooms can provide to society. Um, some of the benefits including, uh, include the remediation of agriculture runoff. Um, on the top you see a number of mushroom species. I know it's kind of small. Trust me, they're there. Um, and then a number of potentially disease-causing organisms that are often the result of um, wildlife and, and in rainwater runoff. Um, and so these mushrooms, when incorporated into riparian buffers, have the ability to um, kill a number of these pathogens, uh, some of which are beginning to develop antibiotic resistance. Um, they've also, um, certain mushrooms are also capable of remediating chemical, chemical contaminants as a result of industrial activities. Um, what's really neat about these mushrooms is that they have the ability to metabolize these chemical contaminants rather than just absorb and translocate. Uh, as is common with more traditional bioremediation strategies, plant-based bioremediation strategies. Um, and so you see things in here like uh, organophosphates, pesticides, uh, trinitrotoluene, that's TNT. Um, so this is, you know, a remarkable way to use a living organism to um, sort of fix the damage we as humans have done to the environment. Mushrooms can also be used as pesticides. Um, the most expensive mushroom in the world is a member of the Cordyceps genus, which is pictured here. Uh, it infects caterpillars in the Himalayan plateau in Central Asia. Um, and like I said, this is the most expensive mushroom in the world. There's also certain Cordyceps species that will infect ants or grasshoppers. Um, can really help to reduce uh, economic, reduce populations to a below an economic threshold. Um, mushrooms are also very beneficial in human health. They have a great ability to bridge the gap between foods and medicines. There are a number of different uh, disease and disease pathologies that they've been associated with affecting. Um, I've got citations for all of these if you'd like to talk more about this later. Um, but really there, you know, there needs to be more research done into the applied aspects of mycology. Um, it's a great way to sort of bridge, explore the interaction between both human and environmental health. So on to the journey. Uh, Bangladesh was um, first became a country in 1971. Before that, it was known as uh, East Pakistan after the 1947 British partition. 
but due to um, a number of factors, not the least of which was geographic separation, um, Bangladesh fought for their independence um, and gained that in 1971. Um, there continue to be a number of uh, political issues in Bangladesh that have sort of um, affected its, its coming of age as a country. Um, but in addition to the political turmoil, Bangladesh is also the site of the highest concentrations of naturally occurring arsenic um, in the world. And it's, it infects the soil and groundwater and it has been described by some as a public health emergency. Uh, close to 50% of ba Bangladesh's population is at risk of exposure. Um, and traditional strategies rely on the filtration from water, um, which is significantly inhibited by access to financial resources um, in terms of getting this technology out to the people who really need it. Um, so in, in doing my research for my master's degree, I came across this paper. Um, mitigation of arsenic mediated uh, stress in rats um, and while it is a big jump from rats to humans uh, this is very promising and it's the light bulbs went off in my head and I wanted to explore this more uh, how can mushrooms help Bangladesh um, so I traveled to Bangladesh with two main questions um, what is the current state of mushroom activities in Bangladesh um, from an extension standpoint and then are specialty mushrooms an appropriate strategy in preventing um, arsenic toxicity? And so for the first question, um, I knew a little bit of information going there. Amanda had traveled to Bangladesh in, uh, in the year prior and wanted me to come visit her the next time she would be traveling to Bangladesh. So I said, hey, find something with mushrooms and I'll be there. And so she was able to come up with the National Mushroom Development and Extension Center. Um, which engages in research activities to promote a national collection of useful mushrooms, human resource and agriculture development training, researching quality parameters of products and production tools to enhance branding and verification, expanding consumer awareness, in addition to increasing consumer interest in order to develop trade relationships for an export-driven uh, development. Um, so that's, that's what she found, and I was there to explore it. Um, I know in their mission, this is their mission statement that I just read to you, and they describe export-driven development. Um, just out of curiosity, does, does anybody have any opinion on the goal of export-driven development versus regional development in terms of a novel crop such as mushrooms? It could be for anything, um, specialty, you know, high-value horticulture products. I don't know if anybody has an opinion on, on that. I don't want to be the only one talking here, so. You mean like is it the kind of thing the World Bank can well, exploit, uh, you know, in the developed areas? Right. You can, can you, I mean, the goal of export, is it ex exploitation? It's, let me say, is in provide shooting for the goal of an export-driven development opportunity. Are you exploiting environment and people, or can you really help people with an export-driven it's been used to exploit mm -hmm. the developed areas. Right. Whether it could help them or not, I don't know. Anybody else? That's sort of what I think, but I don't want to, you know, I know some people believe in that, that export-driven development strategies are the way, the way to go. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to talk with anybody after that, uh, after the talk. Um, so. Uh, the National Mushroom Development and Extension Center, currently there are 16 sub-centers located throughout the Republic of Bangladesh. The center is in Savar, the, the, the main um, center. And the facility was started in 1979 and experienced a significant lag phase until 2003 when they began to gear up uh, production systems thanks to uh, grants from the Asian Development Bank. In 2009, the Japanese Development Bank um, Ex gave another grant to the um, Extension Center, uh, promoting their current capacity of the 16 sub-centers um, and making it a part of the national extension system in Bangladesh. Um, one thing I should mention is that um, literally, literally translated, the word mushroom in Bangla um, is frog umbrella. So that may give you sort of a hint on, on how people will accept mushrooms as a food product. Um, so 
After arriving in Dhaka, we traveled to the southern district of Noakhali, um, and I hired a translator and spent the time roaming the countryside, uh, pursuing my own interests. Uh, we found several former mushroom farmers, no current mushroom farmers, um, who told us that when, when they were selling mushrooms, they would sell for um, about 200 taka per kilogram fresh and 2,000 taka per kilogram dry. Taka is the currency of Bangladesh. It's roughly 80 taka to a dollar. Um, so this is a pretty high value product um, and, and maybe not within the purchasing capacity of many rural households. Um, they mentioned that uh, obstacles to the expansion of their enterprise uh, included lack of acceptance of mushrooms as a food product, uh, lack of profitable market outlets, and unreliability or poor quality of spawn that was being sold to them by the, uh, either the National uh, Extension Center or private enterprises. Um, but there was promise that um, they recognized, they began to cultivate mushrooms because they recognized the unique properties mushrooms contain as a food item. Uh, one of the gentlemen we spoke to uh, began cultivating mushrooms because his father was sick and he wanted to grow mushrooms because he thought the mushrooms would help his father get better. Um, and so you see this in the more educated individuals that they can recognize and understand the benefit um, that, that mushrooms can have in the human body. Um, following our visit in Noakhali, and there were a couple other experiences in this region. Um, excuse me, while I was in Nuakli, we traveled to Kamila, uh, which is another city uh, in Bangladesh, and visited this Kamila substation. Um, here they were currently producing mushrooms. They sold for 130 taka per kilogram fresh and 1500 taka per kilogram dry. Um, and they explained to me a little bit about the um, training that growers must go through to be a part of this extension system. Um, it's a three-day training program. Farmer, um, farmers or people are paid 600 taka to attend the training. Um, and then they're given 25 free spawn bags to begin their own enterprise. So you really, you know, there's really a big um, push to get these farmers to attend the meetings. A great incentive, 600 taka, that's, um, you know, some of the rural day laborers. We talked with their daily wages um, ranged from 200 taka to 500 taka uh, per day. And so this is, you know, potentially three days worth of wage um, by coming to this training session. Whether they learned to grow mushrooms or not, you know, they were there and they got paid. Um, we were, um, oh, so once the, the tr farmers go through the training, um, maybe a week or two afterwards, the uh, Extension agents will visit their farms uh, and provide troubleshooting advice. If they aren't able to, be, to sell their mushrooms, then they will, uh, the extension center will buy the mushrooms from them, um, usually in the dried form at whatever the um, prevailing market rate is. Um, during this time, we were also able to visit the Feni substation. Feni is another city in Bangladesh. Um, and we, um, I, on the way, to this station, we came across a doctor. Um, I don't know. He was he'd been in the pharmacy trade for roughly 25 years. I don't think he he hadn't been to formal medical school, but um, anyways, he was referred to as a doctor within the village, um, and he prescribed pharmaceuticals and he used a pharmaceutical in his practice, one drug that was a mushroom derived product from Myanmar. In 2005, during the caretaker government, he wasn't able to access this medicine and decided then that he would grow his own mushrooms. Now, mind you, this doctor was a former mushroom grower. Um, again, he cited limited market development as his main obstacle in developing this enterprise. Um, the Narikel Bagan is the name of the sub-center in Feni. Uh, that means coconut garden. They had a number of coconut trees. It was, uh, they were evaluating for different, different um, uh, parameters and so we got to eat a lot of coconuts during this visit. It was, it was fun. Um, and we talked to the director of the sub-center um, who described uh, a failure, again, a failure of acceptance as a food item. Um, lack of markets, failure to create a systemic production system, and poor uh, retention of growers in the training program. 
And so we see this, this big national um, program, but it, it's having trouble getting off the ground. And we'll talk about some of the strategies in the next, with the next visit. Um, but one of the, the positive impacts of mushroom production is that it can be done in sort of a local village level. Um, a number of Muslim uh, communities, women are confined to the cloister or the group of houses that surround their own household. They aren't um, permitted to travel to markets um, or leave this tight village area. And so mushrooms, you don't have to go out to the farms. You don't have to go to the field to cultivate mushrooms. You can do it in your backyard or next to your house. Um, and so there have been a couple of papers that suggest mushroom enterprise may be a method of gender sensitive development, a way to empower women in Bangladesh. Um, we met with one woman, this picture is, I took that picture, that's not from the paper. Um, we met with this woman who, she was engaged in mushroom production, um, but said that um, she didn't know if it was a profitable enterprise because her husband took care of all the financial matters. So I guess I posed the question, is this really a gender sensitive opportunity or do they need to tweak it a little? Um, so following, um, uh, after a number of different experiences later on in the fall, I was able to visit the center in Savar and met with the, direct, the national director of the mushroom development program, uh, Dr. Neera Chandra Shakar. Um, in Savar, it's the primary stage of development. They're trying to establish processing and production technology. And they maintain a very close relationship with India, China, and Japan. Uh, this is the source of all their germplasm for the mushrooms. Uh, so these are all exotic species that are being imported into Bangladesh. Maybe if they were able to isolate um, locally growing species that may be more culturally adapted, um, environmentally adapted, they may have more success in their production systems. Maybe the shape of the oyster mushroom was throwing off consumers if they found something more recognizable to them. They may want to eat it more, um, but I think there's really a big obstacle of perception with mushrooms in Bangladesh as a whole. Um, there are a number of advertising programs on the radio and television trying to promote the benefits of mushroom as a food source. Um, and People, some of the people I talked to suggested that this was making a difference. There's a few papers out saying it's making a difference in promoting mushroom consumption in Bangladesh. But I, I'm still skeptical that, that they are um, actually making an impact. Um, so just to conclude that section a little bit, uh, Bangladesh harbors a very robust extension system for promoting mushroom development, but it's a very top-down oriented program um, coming from international entities to um, to the local level. Um, why, why do they want to grow the, the mushrooms in Bangladesh? Do they, do they, anyway, why, why do they pick Bangladesh? Is it very labor intensive or something? Mm. Well, so, I mean, mushrooms can be produced in a variety of scales and methods. I mean, you can produce it on the household level, um, but, you know, here in the United States, they're all produced on a big, huge industrial scale. Um, you know, I'm not really sure why they chose mushrooms as a development opportunity and why it's received so much funding. Um, it, I mean, it, it very much seemed like they were trying to force mushrooms on the population. So, um, yeah, but then here in the Chittagong Hill Track region, um, and I'll talk about this region a little bit more, this is a, um, an area of very high indigenous uh, a very high concentration of indigenous ethnicities that are probably more closely related to uh, the Burmese, the Myanmar um, folks than, than the actual uh, people that make up the population of Bangladesh. Um, and they love mushrooms. You can find them in the market. Um, you can find them, you know, people are very eager and readily consume mushrooms. So um, and moving forward, maybe the extension center should concentrate their efforts in, in this region. Um, I know there's some tension between, um, you know, the the Banglas and and the indigenous ethnicities um, in several areas. 
Um, but I was actually had the opportunity to work there, um, working with a Spanish NGO, and, I, and I'll get to that in, in a little bit. Um, so while I was in Noakley, we were able to travel around, and um, you know, I wanted to develop the agriculture context. I wanted to learn how farmers were, how they farmed, what they used. Um, while we were in Noakley, oh, this is Dr. Chandra Charkar uh, at the in Savar. Um, a few pictures of mushrooms that they were growing there. There's the pink oyster. Uh, it's pink, but it doesn't really taste very good, so I don't know. Um, these are reishi mushrooms being grown uh, near Finney. Uh, this was one of the most prolific growers in the area. He had 2,000 of these spawn bags that you can see. Um, and this is... Um, it's a uh, uh, rice paddy straw. So they take the harvest the rice and then the stubble's left in the field and they will harvest that. Um, there's also um, some of the rice crops they'll grow are just for the vegetative matter and not for the rice. So they use that too. Um, but you know, th one of the great things about oyster mushroom is you can grow it on just about anything, as Dan can attest. Uh, you can grow it on toilet paper rolls, you can grow it on coffee grounds, you can grow it on crude oil. Um, it's really a very, uh, very interesting mushroom. Um, this is in the, uh, the, the Fenny office. Um, and so we see that education was um, a big factor in adoption of mushroom growing technology. So we could say that um, mushrooms make you more educated, yeah, maybe, probably not. Um, but that education can promote the adoption of mushroom growing um, and consumption. And so you know, I think we can suggest that um, an education program in Bangladesh sort of as a whole for, but one of the complementary goals would, that, would be that people would eat more mushrooms. And so, education. Um, so like I said, I was able to spend some time in Noakli uh, talking with farmers, learning um, how they farmed. Um, in the markets, uh, market vendors were generally very knowledgeable about product origins. They can tell you what town it was from, what country it was from, if it was imported or domestic. Um, and one problem is the post-harvest storage and handling of high-value, perishable horticulture commodities. Um, formalin use is widespread in the value chain. Uh, do you guys know formalin? It's used to preserve cadavers, um, highly toxic, highly carcinogenic. Um, but it's used to keep the produce from rotting uh, from the, from the, when they buy it in the local market and transport it to the urban market. Um, so we talk about rural-urban connections in terms of urban food security, um, but in providing that food to the urban populations, there may be greater risks. Um, there's also reports of people using calcium carbide and, um, and etiphon for fruit ripening, both of which uh, are not permitted for edible crops. Um, and so there's, there is, are public health risks in, in the horticulture value chain in Bangladesh that uh, very seriously need to be addressed. Um, and people understand these risks and, and do not want to eat formerly contaminated food. It's unfortunate that it's mostly only the upper classes that are able to avoid this risk because uh, grocery stores have branded their products as formalin free and will charge a premium. Um, in Noakali, we encountered a number of non-governmental groups engaged in agriculture and extension development. Um, you see up top, this is a, a focus group organized by the Noakali Rural Development Society. Um, and this society performs duties similar to an extension agent, um, except they focus on smallholder uh, farms. They provide seeds, facilitate microcredit opportunity, organize farmers into groups, they provide tractors and, and arrange for cooperation um, within regions um, and disseminate information and technology. Um, when we talked in this focus group, the farmers, you know, you ask farmers what their problems are and you better have your tape recorder on because they, farmers love to talk about how their, their lives could be better. Um, they mentioned very few storage options for perishable goods that can't be sold at the market. Um, Winter is the most productive season for them, uh, and, but yet they're limited by um, access to water resources. It is, winter is the dry season in Bangladesh, um, and they 
like I said, where you know you think with this flooded, all these flooded rice paddies that water wouldn't be an issue, but uh, in, in the dry season it can become a very serious issue. Uh, some other complaints uh, were lack of transportation infrastructure, limited educational opportunities for their children, um, problems with soil salinity, and lack of access to capital. Uh, down here in the bottom left, we were talking with a gentleman who led an IPM club. Um, this is a group of farmers who try to disseminate sustainable technologies for pest management. Things like pheromone traps were very popular within this group. Um, and the leader, this is a translated quote, he said that waiting on government extension service providers is a dark hope. Um, so they've really sort of given up on the government service providers and providing extension services to their agriculture communities. Um, and so this was, mind you, this was all in Noakali, uh in the Southern District. And so upon hearing this, I said, well, hey, why don't we go talk to the extension officers? Um, so we met with uh, an Upazilla agriculture officer. Um, Upazilla is just one of their districts, sub-district. Uh, sub Do you know the, the hierarchy? Can you rattle it off? Maybe some, somebody else knows. Yeah. So it's just how the, they arranged. Uh, yeah. Every district. Then I am coming from Bangladesh. Uh -huh. I am visiting Kolaba. Kolaba very far from Bangladesh. Okay. Then the first district, first division, district, then Upazila. Okay. Yes. Um, so we met with the Upazila agriculture officer. Um, whose primary duties, this is self-reported primary duties, include, uh, thank you, um, include fertilizer distribution, uh, reporting on agriculture activities, and monitoring the block officers. Um, and so why is a government agent involved in fertilizer distribution? Um, they can probably, well, anyways. But this agent was not from the region. He wasn't from Nuakli. He was from another part of the country. He doesn't know the region very well. Um, you know, some of his main problems, he advises farmers on pest management strategies, but many farmers will come in with what they think are pest management issues. It really turned out to be soil nutrient deficiencies. But there's really a, a, a lack of soil testing facilities in Bangladesh. Um, you know, most of the farmers will receive, get their advice from the local shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper, his first question is, isn't, what is your problem? You know, what have you done? The first question is, how much money do you have? And so the shopkeeper will sell the farmers a product based on, not on their problems, but how much money they have. And so if they've got a lot of money, he'll sell them an expensive chemical or product. Um, if, they're, if he doesn't have a lot of money, then um, he won't. Uh, these are a list of the pesticides that Farmers said they were using in Noakali. Um, I want to highlight one right here. Lindane has been banned in everywhere, every part of the world except for India and Bangladesh. Um, in addition to killing insects, it also kills people. And so it's been discontinued for sale in the United States. Um, we found one farmer that was using it. Uh, some of the other problems is many of the farmers can't read. Um, and so you have these highly technical pesticide labels and they aren't able to understand the, the directions and how to apply these pesticides. Certainly there's no PPE, personal protective equipment, um, but you know, they're, they're very readily available. There's um, you know, probably three chemical and seed shops to every small, I mean, every, every locality. Um, after talking with the, um, uh, the Upazilla agriculture officer, um, we went and found the plant protection officer um, who described, his, he said his duties were organizing farmer training. He also grants the pesticide shop licenses. Um, he says f farmer training are organized into small, medium, and large farm groups. Um, about 70% of the farmers in Noakley fall in this small group, a small farm group, 25 in the medium and 5% in the large. Um, landless farmers, sharecroppers, are grouped into the large farmer group, which I don't know if that makes sense or not. 
Um, ag subsidies in Bangladesh are distributed by the Ministry of Ag uh, Fertilizer. There's four basic subsidies. Fertilizer and pesticide are the entirety of the money is directed to the Bangladesh Chemical Industry Association. Diesel and equipment subsidies are direct deposited into farmers' bank accounts by the Ministry of Ag. So a farmer needs to have a, a bank account to be eligible for this money. Um, there's subsidies to seed and seedling producers, which is directed to the Bangladesh Agriculture Development Commission. Um, and then there's price setting subsidies for rice and pulse products. Um, did I miss anything? Is it? Great. Um, so <clears throat> following, uh, we did get to visit uh, Ashuganj. Um, I'm saying that right, right, Amanda? Great. Um, so, and here we found a, a, almost a success of the extension workers. Um, I talked with the uh, district, assistant district supervisor of the extension um, activities in this, for this area. Um, you know, we talked with a number of different farmers who none of them complained. Everybody knew their block officer. They talked with the extension agent. Um, I think, you know, what the, dist the district officer said was that this region is more industrially oriented than agriculturally oriented. And so I think when we say Nuakli is just, there's too many farmers. I don't want to say that, right? There's the, the extension officers are overwhelmed. And here there's an appropriate number of extension officers to farmers. And so they can develop a more personal relationship. Um, Let's see, some pictures. This guy was in the CNG with us. Um, CNG is like a natural gas, it's like a three-wheeled cart that you can take between villages. There was a man going around selling these snakes. Um, he said that if he got bit, he had the vaccine so that he wouldn't get poisoned. I don't know. It was really interesting to see him. He brings him out, sort of smacks him around, puffs up his hood. Um, one farm we visited had a pet deer. I don't know, are deer common in Bangladesh? De is this like an endemic thing in the Nuakli region? You can see it's, I don't know if you can see it, it's wearing a collar, so this is clearly somebody's pet. Yeah, just uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with anything. I just wanted to show you the pictures. <laughs> um, so the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Uh, during my time in Bangladesh, I was able to get a consulting position with a Spanish NGO. Um, working in this region. Um, my specific, I was an agriculture technical expert working on rainwater harvesting techniques for dry season agriculture. Um, it was part of their project to uh, strengthening socio-economic rights of indigenous women in the region. Um, when I took this position on, um, I, I don't know, didn't know a lot about rainwater harvesting. I think People had thought that they would have rain, you know, the rain barrels from the harvesting runoff from buildings and things like that. Um, a number of the buildings in this area were thatched roof, not tin roofs that harbor a number of microbial contaminants. Um, so, and at this point, I really became aware of Cornell, not just as a brand and you know a recognizable name, but there's actually professors here that are here to provide help when you need it. Um, Dr. Norman Uphoff and Dr. Peter Hobbs um, and a number of the uh, um, staff here provided some incredible resources um, that helped me in this position. And so essentially what we were doing, the, the, um, uh, the, we were working in the Lama Alikadam area. Uh, it's characterized, like I said, by high populations of indigenous groups. Household income is dependent on agriculture. Uh, the traditional system of cultivation is called jume or jume. It's a shifting cultivation, otherwise known as slash and burn. Um, some of the villages, uh, due to increasing land pressure, uh, these villages would traditionally have a 30 to 50 year rotation now because of increased land pressure. Um, they're shortened to three to five. So the soil and the ecology doesn't have a chance to recover uh, the soil organic matter and soil nutrient capacity. And so there, you've got serious problems with erosion um, and loss of, of um, livelihoods almost because they fall into this cycle of poverty um, where traditional cultivation practices result in reduced soil fertility, 
uh, decreasing vigor of crops and their resulting progeny. All of these villages save their seeds. Um, further contributing to lower producti productivity and resulting in reduced wages and food insecurity. Um, and so I, my goal was to encourage more perennial systems. Um, this is a companion planting guide uh, that we gave to the, so I was working with a local implementing agency, uh, Taranga, I think is what they were called, um, and they had their own agriculture officers. So I was helping to train the agriculture officers who would then disseminate this information to the local villages. Um, and in determining projects to implement, can you guys see that? Um, in determining projects to implement, we were able to go around and interview the villages. Um, you know, I tried to engage in a participatory approach to determine who needed what, what their needs were, and work together. We introduced a number of solutions that came from uh, this publication. Uh, if you can see that, implementing integrated natural resource management projects under the natural, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Uh, the National Royal, Rural Employment Guarantee Act is an act in India. Um, that basically provides a 100 days of paid labor to rural, um, rural people. And so there were a number of strategies for rainwater harvesting and soil water retention that came from this publication uh, that took place in, in eastern India, very close, right on the Bangladesh border. So appropriate technologies that have been developed in a similar region. Um, and then we introduced these to the localities and they were able to decide what they wanted to do. Um, there were some cost-sharing arrangements with the implementing organization and the locality. Um, so it wasn't just sort of a donation here, we'll put in you know, a pond for you for nothing. It was the, the villagers were engaged in, in the problem and the solution and oftentimes paid to pay for their labor to work. Um, so a number of the strategies were based on the slope of the land um, we encountered all of these different slopes within the villages. Some people, a uh, few of the more isolated villages, were living exclusively on this 8% and greater slope area. Um, but then, like I said, a number of different slopes. And each strategy depends on the slope um, for its appropriate strategies. To try and just hold the soil, hold the ground, hold the water in in, seri in, in serious moisture events. Um, and here's pictures from the region. Um, this is my, my friend uh, Nico. This is a pond we dug um, or helped to dig with, with one of the local groups. Um, they, you can see this is maybe two or three days after we dug the pond and it's already uh, got more than a meter of water in the bottom of it. Um, this is a, a gully plug. This is the same village. Um, which So when, when the rain falls, you get these channels being cut out of the hill. And these gully plugs are put in place to slow the ground, slow the, the water, so that it reduces erosion. Uh, eventually you'll get like, um, the soil will build up behind the gully plug and you'll have a flat space to cultivate your crops. It's full of this rich organic topsoil um, that has fallen from the rest of the hill. And so, you know, these are some of the strategies we worked with. Um, and again, like I said, you know, mushrooms were commonly consumed in this area, but I didn't really see the presence. There are, I think, two of the extension centers. Um, in this area, to travel by foreigners is uh, difficult. It's regulated. You have to get a special pass to enter um, the Chittagong Hill Tracks, and you are, n are not supposed to be working when you're there. Um, this was all volunteer, so it wasn't working per se. Um, but it's, it's a, there's a lot of turmoil in this region. Um, that I don't really want to get into right now. Um, so just sort of reflecting on uh, my experience in Bangladesh, it was, it was I mean, it was, it was a great country. I had a wonderful time. Um, I had a lot of great experiences. But I think um, in terms of the mushrooms, it, you know, it was a very top-down oriented approach. Um, so in, in Rwanda, uh, I worked for a USAID Hort Crisp Trellis Fund. That sounds like a lot. Um, it's a critical, CRISP is critical research support program, um, and the Trellis Fund engages graduate students, provides funds for them to travel for two weeks to uh, 13, 14 different countries. I mean, you only get to travel to one country, 
and work with one NGO in that country. Um, I was paired with uh, Sustaining Rwanda Youth Organization, and they had identified mushroom cultivation as a mechanism. They were hoping to uh, improve household food security and provide um, rural enterprise for one village that they work with in near Butari, the southern in the southern region. Um, and so, when I arrived in Rwanda, I spent the first week traveling to a number of different um, mushroom people engaged in the mushroom industry. Mushrooms are very popular in Rwanda. Um, it's considered a high-value food item that's uh, associated with significant cultural events. Um, Sunday, Sundays, everybody goes to church. It's a family day. So they eat mushrooms. Um, for Easter or other religious holidays, uh, baptisms, they'll eat mushrooms. Um, and so, you know, it was once very expensive, but now it's about half the price of meat um, in the market, and it's, it's quite readily available. So this is a group we met with that had their own mushroom lab. Um, everybody cultivates mus oyster mushroom um, because it's the easiest to grow. Uh, this group was started from what's called a seed fund from the UN Development Program um, to start their own enterprise. They, they do grow some mushrooms, but mostly they're t tasked with education. Um, and they work with a couple of groups throughout the country to, uh, that are more technically oriented. But this group was very education oriented. Uh, Kigali Farms is uh, probably our most helpful partner in, in Rwanda. Um, they're trying to, uh, like it says, bring affordable, high-impact crops to Rwanda. Um, the, I think it was the COO of Kigali Farms was a former CFO of Omegang Brewery um, just down the road in Cooperstown. So he asked me to bring him a bottle of the Abbey Ale that we shared when we met up. Um, but they're trying to uh, provide, th this is really neat because they were trying to, they're promoting mushroom cultivation in rural areas and then buying the mushroom and providing a marketplace. Here they have solar dryers um, to extend the shelf life of the mushrooms so that they can um, impact and access more markets. BN Producers was probably the biggest mushroom producer, mushroom distributor. Uh, they were a wholesaler um, in Rwanda. Um, they, uh, they had a retail outlet in probably the biggest market in Kigali, the capital city. Uh, although we did fi hear rumors that they weren't actually paying their growers, that they were just taking the mushrooms and writing an IOU. Um, in near Butari, there's the Rubona Agriculture Experiment Station. Um, this is a partnership with the Chinese government and a demonstration of Chinese agriculture technology. Um, this is the media sterilizer they were using to sterilize their bags. Um, they use an elephant grass media, is what they call it. It's really tall grass. You can see it in the background here. You know, it grows. 11, 12 feet tall. Um, these are the spawn bags that they were uh, cultivating. This is so. This is a um, uh, subsidized. You know, these bags are way below the market price um, for other other. Um, you know, Kigali Farms produces spawn bags, and they sell them for 400 Rwandan francs for a bag. Um, the Rabona Experiment Station sells them for 300 Rwandan francs per bag. And they probably don't even, you know, they don't have to sell them for that. They could give them away. And they do, especially when it's a program targeted for rural enterprise development. Um, after we visited all the farms, so if you see here, one thing I learned in visiting these farms was just sort of how they grow mushrooms in Rwanda. Um, because mushrooms require a high moisture capacity, high moisture content, um, it's very difficult to control, to create a controlled atmosphere. Um, and so they'll put the mushroom bags into the soil and so they can regulate soil moisture much better than they can regulate atmospheric moisture. Um, and so I offered a training. I spent about an hour talking what is a mushroom, um, providing marketing advice um, and production, technical production advice. And then we built a pilot plot behind this community church um, so that women could see how to grow mushrooms. Uh, we gave them maybe 50 bags to cultivate as a community. Um, the training was targeted at a women's cooperative, um, and Rwanda is a very sort of cooperative country. Um, they, the women are, they're identified as as having um, malnourished children. 
They're invited to attend uh, a maternal and child feeding class. It's a 10-week class. And after completing the class, they are invited to join the cooperative. And when you become a cooperative in Rwanda, you're given a savings account and formally recognized by the Rwandan government. You're given like a certificate. Um, and so, you know, they have a savings account for which they could promote microcredit activities. Um, and it was targeted by the, the um, Sustaining Rwanda Youth Organization for a number of uh, rural enterprise activities. Um, and so following the training, we, uh, we bought some mushrooms and brought them to this training. And the women, we all cooked them together um, and then shared lunch after following the training. Uh, they make a really nice sort of curry, mushroom curry with peanut flour, um, onions, and tomatoes. Uh, some other rural enterprise that we witnessed in, <clears throat> in Rwanda, um, this is a wooden cup, it's intricately carved, um, it's very nice. This is all sorghum that's being malted. They do a lot of home brewing and beer production in, in the rural areas of Rwanda. Um, I didn't try any. I don't know if I regret that or not. Um, and so just sort of reflections on the Rwanda experience. Um, Market access in our specific project was limited by household consumption. So I don't know if that's a bad thing or not. It sort of affects the sustainability of the project because they aren't able to generate income, but they're also getting a nutritious food source in their household. So, you know, it goes, goes back and forth. Um, the Sustaining Rwanda Youth Organization, uh, the director and some of their volunteers you know, I was, I was with a different volunteer every day, which was nice, but they weren't able to develop the technical capacity that they needed to encourage this enterprise in Rwanda. Um, there were some serious issues with termites, um, so I was able to suggest biocontrol options. I don't know if they were able to get a hold of those biocontrol options or not. Um, and so it's really difficult to determine what impact my time in Rwanda made with the people in Rwanda. Um, it was a profound experience for me, but um, I don't know uh, what impact I had in the locality. Um, comparing the two, Rwanda um, was a little bit easier to work. I feel like the, you know, there, there are some very serious ethnic issues in Rwanda, but the government has made laws saying that you cannot differentiate between the ethnicities in public media. Um, and so, you know, the Rwanda experience in their history is tragic, and I think they're really looking forward to look beyond that um, and really work together at being one Rwanda. Um, so, I don't, I don't know. Um, but the legacy of mushroom consumption in Rwanda was, was very important. It's viewed as a high-value product um, with a considerable demand. Um, looking to the future, um, I think more work on monitoring and evaluating mushroom enterprise, especially in Rwanda, is important. Um, there's a lot of information right now about biochar, um, whether it works or not. People have different views. Um, but in planting the mushrooms in the soil, like we saw in Rwanda, um, you really are increasing the soil organic matter and could potentially um, pave the way for more perennial cropping systems, um, such as tree fruits and, and agroforestry related systems. Um, and then, you know, what is the role in the government, other agencies? I wrote inhibiting up there because, you know, is in subsidizing their spawn bags, is the Rwanda Extension Service, are they inhibiting appropriate market development? And then how do you introduce innovation to a rural community without having them be dependent on your, um, on, on you giving input, you know. The women, they, after they ate all the mushrooms, they said, okay, can we have some more spawn bags now? They said, well, we don't have any money. So I think the project sort of ended at that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you introduce a new idea without um, the people becoming dependent on your inputs? Um, so that's all I've got today. Thank you for coming out. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, going back to the Bangladesh situation in terms of sort of seeing like limited success of mushroom cultivation mm -hmm. in terms of their original target goal um, as like a household enterprise kind of um, as a household enterprise. But um, do you think that there's opportunities? You know, you started talking about maybe like in terms of remediation 
Yeah. Um, probably. Um, you know, I. You look at. Mm, in terms of agriculture inputs, you know, there's pretty heavy transportation costs that are associated with organic inputs. Um, there's a lot of uh, ammonium nitrate available in Bangladesh. Um, and so, as you know, to sort of differentiate, like the um, you know agriculture mushrooms, uh, excuse me, um, the um, you know for agriculture inputs, I think it'd be difficult. You know, and then uh, you know I don't know how do you incorporate it into sort of a market-based system to get it out to the people. Um, I mean, there definitely could be opportunity. I just don't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. Vegetable consumption in in Bangladesh was not very common, you know, around the time of their independence. Uh, my understanding is that once um, people started working, going to Saudi Arabia and other countries to seek uh, employment, they said, you know, they started bringing back the tradition of vegetable consumption. Um, and so, you know, in that way, it's more of the organic sort of ground up adoption of these habits. Um, I don't know if there would be a um, education program that could combat the obstacle of perceptions of mushrooms in Bangladesh. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Were they, um, were they doing anything Yeah, uh, Bangladesh is a very densely populated country, and so space is a uh, is a constraint. Uh, so that's why we were only seeing substrate cultivation. Plus, you know, a lot of the yeah, a lot of the f uh, wood is used for fuel for cooking fires, um, and so there's not really that abundance of forest resources that we see here. I mean, in Bangladesh, everything's got a use, it seems like. Um, and so, you know, to be able to identify a substrate, an appropriate substrate, I think it's difficult. Yes, sir? Okay, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, you know, the Bangladesh government is going to be popularized with the mushroom cultivation. Excuse me? The Bangladesh government is mm -hmm. trying to popularize the mushroom cultivation. Right. Uh, there are so many locations have identified uh, Noakali, mm -hmm. Kumilla, and the substation Fenn. Mm -hmm. Also, Narikel Bagan. Mm -hmm. oh, the Narikel Bagan is in Fenn. Yeah. Know, Mm -hmm. Why you are not selecting? Oh, I did go to. So, um. uh, two missions there. Uh, market facilities of mushroom is available? Uh, Market, mm -hmm. Marketing facilities are available in Bangladesh? Like cold storage? Oh, they said in the world before. No, no, the mm -hmm. mushroom is popular mm -hmm. in, 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 in our area, but it is not in rural area. Mm -hmm. So how they sell the mushroom? The mm -hmm. Well, so the, I mean, that was one of the 
to answer your second question first, um, you know, farmers were selling their mushrooms within in their village. Um, you know, there were significant obstacles of transportation. And when, you know, in these sort of village units, they're able to educate the, their, the other villagers about the benefits of mushroom. Um, and so I think in that way, they're able to develop these market mechanisms. Um, they, they still were not sufficient to, you know, I talked to more former mushroom farmers than current mushroom farmers. So, you know, something, something's not working in that end. Um, and then we did visit Savar. I spent a day in Savar um, talking with the, the national director of the program. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so I, di I did visit Savar. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, help, your sky, help yourself to cookies and coffee. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>